Um, first, just for some, some housekeeping, uh, this, this conversation will be recorded um, for future references, purposes, things that if you're also interested in anything of interest that you're here, take notes, uh, you'll be able to reference that to later. Second, there's some cards. Uh, I think you all might have uh, index cards where if at any point you have any questions, kind of write those down uh, and then pass them, I guess, to your right or to your left and make sure they kind of get up. Uh, and basically the format will be uh, more of a conversation. Uh, we've all known each other in all no kinds of different contexts for a while and we've worked together. Uh, so our hope is that uh, we get to share as much of their work, their successes, the gaps, and their needs uh, over time. So if you have questions about the technology entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem in the context of Puerto Rico, uh, this is the place to be. Uh, in the context of the, the conference itself, 90% uh, of it is in the panels, it's around austerity and it's challenges and all these pieces. This is essentially one of the few ones that's all about uh, opportunity and how does that actually work in practice. And we'll, we'll get a chance to hear uh, specifics of companies, uh, programs, uh, funds, relationships, global and otherwise, of what's happening in Puerto Rico. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, connect and reach out to these incredible women uh, after. Uh, if you have uh, to do that, again, write your email or your contact information on the card, press the right, make sure to get it, uh, and then uh, I'll make myself accountable to making sure that all these dots are connected. So if you have to leave for some other panel or something else, that uh, they get the chance to connect with you, uh, because that is something that you'll discuss more, is that uh, as, as much as everyone's done, uh, everyone needs all the help you can get. So I'm excited for more of this sort of dot connecting come to happen in the conversation today. Um, so, that being said, uh, we'll, we'll kind of sort of jump in, uh, and again, so the format, we'll, we sort of carved out a few minutes uh, for each to just give you sort of a brief overview, have sort of some slides uh, of kind of their work, who they are. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a little bit of context uh, for each, uh, but I'll, I'll carve out the bulk just to let them sort of tell you more uh, from their perspective what they've been up to. Uh, and then the vast majority of it will be a conversation about what's going on uh, on the ground. Uh, as best as we can all read the words, there's just a lot. Uh, there's just a lot happening uh, in real time. So, uh, for starters, Laura, uh, we have Sir Laura Cantero, Grupo Guayacan, I mean, one of the longest running programs uh, on the island, uh, essentially promoting uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we have the Yanis. Uh, which is it's primarily everything related to the creative industry, so very broadly defined uh, around uh, art uh, and creativity uh, and everything uh, under that umbrella. Uh, and Cristina, uh, which operates Cormena 66, which is, serves as sort of the, the 311 for the entrepreneurship ecosystem, right? So whether you are a farmer or you're a tech entrepreneur or uh, you're starting some tourism company, uh, there's a one-stop shop that I guess you basically can point you to uh, all the, the all the resources you might need. Um, so with that, Laura, you can uh, kick us off. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today. Thanks for having us and for coming to um, our mini workshops. And I think it's good that it's a small group, so we can all. Um, come well, sorry, I actually forgot to introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, Ramfis Castro, originally from Guayama, uh, Puerto Rico, recently relocated about four years ago now, um, supporting my wife's uh, entrepreneurship path uh, into acting, I love acting, um, and my day job. I first, before I was an entrepreneur, multiple times, uh, supported the tech ecosystem in all kinds of different flavors, which we'll talk about later, uh, and these days my day job is I help other founders, basically by investing in them um, in all kinds of different ways. Primarily, they are more science-less companies, um, inside and outside of, of Puerto Rico. So, uh. Great. Uh, well, my name is Laura Gantero. I'm Executive Director for Grupo Guayacan Inc. Um, as Francis alluded to earlier, Guayacan is Puerto Rico's longest-standing entrepreneur support organization. So how many of you are based in Puerto Rico, just to get a sense of the audience? <laughs> Only Mina and Clotilde and Veronica and Jose, my husband. OK, that's great. <laughs> uh, Mina and Clotilde are longtime collaborators of Guayagang. In fact, uh, Clotilde was our first executive director back in 96. So pleasure to have you here 
today. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do um, and, and some impact uh, statistics that we just published today in the second anniversary of Hurricane Maria just to get a sense of how many entrepreneurs we've supported in this period of time. Um, and then um, I'm very, very happy to be here with, with the audience whom I've collaborated with on that great book that she has in front of her on the creative economy in Puerto Rico and also with Cristina and the team at Colmena who really work hard to get all of the entrepreneurs on the right path, as, as Ramfis was saying. Um, you know, many times entrepreneurs who are starting out don't know where to go, um, and the Puerto Rican ecosystem has seen an explosion of activity in the last five or six years, so it's important to, to help them um, along the way. So, um, as I said, we're a nonprofit based in Puerto Rico, founded 23 years ago under the firm belief that entrepreneurship and private equity investing were going to be instrumental for Puerto Rico's long-term um, economic growth. So we believe that premise to be even truer today than it was 23 years ago. Um, and part of what has helped in our success through the years is that we are a nonprofit, but we have a revenue-producing business model. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier before, it is important for nonprofits to make money. The, the, the catch is really how that money is used for whatever our, our social or economic cost is in this case. So together with a partner based in New York called Abbott Capital, we manage a private equity fund of funds. That is an investment product for Puerto Rican investors looking for a triple bottom line. That means that they are going to get a financial return out of their investment, but they're also going to know that the management fee that they pay for the fund gets reinvested into Puerto Rican entrepreneurs. So uh, that has allowed us to continue to operate for our 23 years. Um, and also, because of this explosion I was alluding to earlier, uh, we found that the management fees we were getting from the funds were no longer enough to run all the programs we wanted to run. So in 2016, to commemorate our 20th anniversary, we also launched an endowment. Um, so many of you might be familiar with university endowments and things of the sort, and, and they're not really very, very common in, in Puerto Rico for nonprofits, but we decided it was the way to help our programs and our entrepreneurs going forward. So basically, what is it that we do? We offer entrepreneurial education, and this is something we can get into a little bit later um, with Ramfis. I know this is one of the things he <laughs> loves. Uh, formal education does not necessarily provide the right tools for entrepreneurs to build and grow their businesses. So I like to say to people, you know, entrepreneurs at different stages come to Guayacan to learn. We can network, we can do mentoring, we can do coaching, we can have a drink and have a great time, but you're going to come here and learn first so that we can ensure that you have the tools and the resources you need when you get out there and, and either start or continue to grow your businesses. So those four logos that you see on the screen are our main programs. Um, we have the i program for idea validation, we have the enterprise competition, which I'm very proud to say that Oscar Serrano, whom you just saw in the first panel, is an enterprise winner for Noticel. So the first $25,000 that Oscar got to build his new platform, Noticel, came from the Guayagan competition. Uh, we have the Guayagan Venture Accelerator Program, that is a program for uh, more mature companies looking to grow outside of Puerto Rico. And finally, uh, a small seed fund to do some of what Ramfis was saying, provide entrepreneurs with the capital that they need um, for growth. So that's basically what we do. These are some of our alumni, just for recognition factor, companies um, in all sorts of different um, industries. Um, and we will talk about this with Yanis in, in a little bit, but um, a big uh, upsurge in, in the creative industry. So you have companies like Inovia Luz on there, who have come to our programs to really figure out how artists can build you know, good, sustainable businesses with, with the work that they do. Um, and you have other players like Atención Atención, huge player in, in the children's entertainment and education um, market. So um, this is the, today's 
secret. This is the impact report we published today. There are copies here, and I'm going to ask Earl if you can pass some of those along. Um, since Maria, we supported 175 businesses in Puerto Rico in, th or in 31 municipalities. Um, so, um, good coverage area. 42 business ideas, 100 startups, and 33 growth companies. Okay. Uh, Francesco, no, the good from, people. From our board that I'm joining us here today. Um, and of these ideas, 80% of them are still in operation two years um, after Maria, and 50% of these businesses were founded by women. Uh, we are all women, coincidentally, and, and the entrepreneurship space in Puerto Rico is filled with women leaders um, that work very, very hard in all of these organizations. The industries is also important because many times people ask us like, oh, but why don't you just choose one industry? Well, Puerto Rico's ecosystem is such a nascent ecosystem that there are opportunities everywhere. So top five industries you have on the screen, technology, health, retail, agribusiness and food, and the services industry. Economic impact of these 175 companies, over 2,500 2, jobs in the Puerto Rican economy, over $250 million in sales, and 28% of these businesses export outside of Puerto Rico. Uh, we provided uh, over a million dollars, 1.2 uh, in uh, seed capital and emergency grants for these entrepreneurs. Uh, over 1,200 hours of coaching for early entrepreneurs, and 98% of our participants say they would recommend our educational program. So that's um, the secret sauce. Um, and these impact statistics only cover the two years since the year. Um, other good things are happening in the ecosystem outside of Guayacan. Uh, earlier this year, in January, uh, Friends of Guayagan founded the Aurora Angel Network. For those of you who are interested in investing, um, that is Puerto Rico's first angel network, uh, and they have uh, deployed over $350,000 since January to uh, Puerto Rico early stage businesses. So, all of you have a phone. If you're interested in staying connected with Guayagan, go ahead and text donate PR to 41444. Um, that allows us to stay in touch with you if we're not able to exchange a business card right away. Um, and you will learn about our Guayagan Giving Day campaign, which begins next Monday, the 23rd. So that's all I have for you guys. I will, I could help you with that. Let Rafis find Tiani's slides. Can you use that, that number again? I wasn't writing fast enough. 41444. Four, four. And you get, you text donate PR. Thank you. You should get a message. Gracias for the invitation. <laughs> because the topic I'm bringing kind of comes from left field in some sense in these types of, of entrepreneurship forums. And I want to you know, give you kind of a, a little bit of background so you understand when we're in the conversation where I'm coming from, okay? So uh, bear with me. Um, so I've been focused on working uh, mainly with the creative industries for the past almost 70 years between New York and Puerto Rico. Uh, any of you familiar with the topic of the creative economy? Yes. Okay, so uh, to me that was a, a big revelation, understanding the potential of the creative industries to really uh, drive, you know, potential economic development. And I had the opportunity to create this, uh, uh, be part of this uh, research with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, where uh, it was really proven how uh, the creative industries not only can impact economic development, but can also uh, create other impacts, you know, social, environmental, cultural, and so on. 
So obviously in the context of Puerto Rico and what's been happening, it is extremely relevant to look at this sector, uh, but even more so when the Hurricane Maria uh, hit the country, right? So um, when I uh, had the opportunity to meet uh, with the Puerto Rico Science Research and Technology Trust and uh, and find a common you know uh, interest in continue to explore this topic, uh, also with the lens of innovation. Uh, so we agreed on do a similar you know sort of re research, in, just focusing on Puerto Rico, uh, one year after Maria. So in that instance, we were going to be looking at you know what exactly is happening in Puerto Rico with the creative economy, uh, how does that intersect with what's happening in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the islands, and kind of get some data together so we can have something to to, to, to hold on to and understand better the potential, right? So. Uh, getting that data became this publication, uh, and, and this publication is now becoming the backbone of what the uh, Puerto Rico um, uh, Science Research and Technology Trust is going to continue doing uh, for these sectors moving forward for economic development, but also, you know, uh, like I said, social and uh, impacts, environmental impacts, and innovation, and, and kind of uh, building on all of those intersections. Uh, so just to give you a very super quick overview, because you've seen the book is pretty big, um, what, we're, what we try to do is understand you know, how we got to entrepreneurship in Puerto Rico, obviously is nothing new, like uh, you've heard from Laura. Um, since the 80s, there's different conditions that have led us to uh, focus, as a con you know, focus uh, in entrepreneurship as one of a very important economic development strategy for the country, right? Um, and I'm not going to go through every single detail, obviously, but I'm going to give you a link so you can download the publication and you can look at all the, all the information. Uh, but what I do want to bring up is that, you know, in the course of all this, uh, the creative economy topic came, you know, started to be infused in, in this conversation. So, um, 2007, you know, we started a movement amongst us, you know, people like me. Uh, individuals, the civil society, trying to bring up why this matters, why we should be looking at this sector. A country like Puerto Rico that is so well known for all the cultural uh, assets, uh, our music, our you know our TV industry, the past advertising. There's so much happening. Uh, our arts. I think there's no uh, no one that can deny that we have tons of talent, and tons of culture that can definitely become assets for value creation, right? So a lot of different steps happened in order for us as a country to validate that. And uh, long story short, this led to uh, legislation that valid, that officialized, you know, the, the creative economy and the creative industries um, as a sector that the trade and commerce department was going to be looking into and supporting moving forward for the economic development of Puerto Rico. Uh, but the creative economy can manifest in many different ways. Uh, so, you know, I think that we've slowly, uh, and probably I hope we can talk a little bit more about this in, uh, today, we've slowly kind of uh, started infusing creative entrepreneurship into our entrepreneurial ecosystem in Puerto Rico, which right now is looking more and more like an ecosystem, right? So uh, slowly but surely through the work of entities like Guayacan and other entities, we've kind of come to shape a really uh, a stronger, I would say, ecosystem uh, every day uh, that really covers all the different stages of development of, of business, right? So these are some of the most important key players. Guayacan here, Palmera is somewhere around here. So we now we know who we are, what role each of them play, and you know we understand that they're really covering the entire journey of development. So I think a part of the next step is really understanding what's the role of the creative industries within that ecosystem. And that's a little bit of what I want to continue talking with you today. Um, in Puerto Rico, uh, because the creative industries are so diverse, uh, the legislation really focuses on these four sectors that you're seeing here, art, design, media, and creative services. Um, because you have to start somewhere, and these are the ones that are, you know, have the biggest potential. Um, so, why the creative industries? Like I said before, uh, this is something that 
is being a world, you know, wide proven that they do have an impact in economies. Countries like Colombia right now are focusing completely, like the new, the new uh, president of the country is like really have a, a complete platform all about the creative industry. So this is a sector that needs to be taken, you know, uh, definitely seriously. It tends to be resilient in times of crisis for many reasons, in particular because it relies a lot on technology and the human resource, so basically generating value from ideas. So it doesn't necessarily need a lot of different resources to kind of um, move forward. And like I said, it, this is the main thing that is really uh, important to me, which is it, it's not all about economic development, but how we can use this sector to propel, you know, more a um, social, cultural, and environmental impacts hand in hand with economic development in a time in which a country, you know, like Puerto Rico, really needs a, that type of, of vision. Um, and ultimately, promoting economic diversification, right? So there are so many other sectors in Puerto Rico that are really important. And this is not about, this is going to be all about the creative economy, is really understanding the role that these sectors play in the other sectors. Right, so with that said, I'm going to jump uh, to basically highlight five examples. Uh, so you kind of get a bit more of a concrete idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, five examples that we cover in the publication. So as, as kind of startups that are kind of headed in, in this direction of, of you know, economic development, social impact, environmental impact, and innovation. Um, Cretazzo in the world of fashion design is rethinking the manufacturing of one of the most polluted industries in the world, which is fashion design. And this is, this, the founder came back from New York to start this business right after the hurricane. So I just want to leave you with that idea. Um, France of Puerto Rico uh, it started also as a very very um, recent business right in the moment that Maria hit. And Maria, really what the American did to this business was really propel and validate the need of businesses like this. What they do is they're a digital platform that connects uh, local artisans and small businesses to global markets. So you can see how a digital you know, uh, media can really uh, uh, impact other, other types of industries and sectors. Um, technology, uh, an example from technology is Brain High, who created an artificial intelligence solution to support the healthcare industry by facilitating medical appointments. Again, they became way bigger even after the hurricane. So just giving you an example of what, why this matters. And in tourism, Local Guest uh, is also a startup leveraging our cultural assets to create a tourism that is a bit more sensible to, <coughs> to the community level, right? So a vision that is a, a bit more social impact, environmental impact, and so on. So uh, with that said, um, I'm just going to jump to uh, here. Um, basically, the point of this publication is not only to document and to say, okay, there's some very important trends here that we need to keep in mind. Uh, like I said, the digital you know, evolution, this idea of emphasizing the local assets, uh, how creativity can innovate in other sectors, help us innovate in other sectors. But there are also some important gaps. Right, and this is the these are the points that I also think we should you know talk a little bit more about, um, making sure that we understand the importance of these creative industries as a sector, that we are paying the right attention to it, you know, in terms of financing, in terms of what type of support they may need uh, at an educational level. Uh, are there are we putting enough emphasis on how these sectors can intersect with other sectors to propel more economic development? Do we have the right uh, measuring mechanisms to, you know, to make sure that as a country we're really leveraging these sectors? Uh, are there enough experts or dedicated programs that are really supporting, you know, the, the, the types of enterprise that come out of these sectors? Uh, and are we using this sector to let, to create more competitive advantage for the country in its entirety, especially in a time where? 
Um, we now have a new DMO, um, destination marketing organization. So there's a lot that can be done with this sector to leverage, you know, uh, our country as a whole. Um, and do we have the right strategies, you know, uh, where everything is sort of aligned to make the best out of these uh, industries? So that's basically, you know, a little bit of background, and I hope that we can take some of these points further in the, in the discussion. So if you go to the Puerto Rico Science Research um, and Technology Trust, you will find it in the menu. You can download there, but that's the that's the URL. Right. <laughs> Where was the link you mentioned? It's here, it's here. Okay. Science Trust. Org slash VR Creativo. And you can all download the document for free. It's in Spanish. It is only in Spanish. Okay. 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 <laughs> hey, I'm going to uh, read through this because I really want to get to the questions and, and the conversation we're going to have. But my name is Cristina Salazar. I'm from Pomena 66. We're a program of the Puerto Rico Science and Technology Trust. Uh, and in Pomena, we serve different roles, but mainly we are your connection or everybody's connection to our local uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem in Puerto Rico. Uh, our front-end operation really is to uh, connect entrepreneurs and business owners or people that have an idea that they want to start a business and don't know where to go, uh, which permits they need, uh, which incentives are available from the government. Uh, they come to us and we direct them and connect them with the organizations uh, that specialize in providing the services that they need. So our job is to know what all of these organizations are doing so we can direct entrepreneurs that can benefit from these services. We have over, this was published in early April, so these numbers have changed, but we have over uh, 212 research partners. Research partners are entrepreneurial support organization, organizations such as uh, Grupo Guayacan. Um, and that has, that has been really important for us to make uh, these connections with these organizations and make them visible and accessible uh, to Puerto Ricans on a larger scale. Uh, we have served over 5,000 now um, entrepreneurs and business owners, served them by connecting them to organizations, connecting them to uh, skills uh, building events um, and such. So basically to give you an idea of what our entrepreneurs or our clients are looking for uh, the most, startup assistance, business plan assistance, mentoring, loans, and marketing and sales, right? So. That's our kind of front end uh, role in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Our back end role has much more to do with ecosystem building. We like to, to consider ourselves as ecosystem builders in Puerto Rico. Uh, and what that means is that in the backstage of this connecting entrepreneurs to the services that they need, we need to make sure that we have a community to connect them to, right? Um, Puerto Rico, as Laura mentioned, has experienced great growth in our ecosystem in the last five years. Uh, but the organizations and the, and the services were very uh, scattered. There were many silos. Uh, and for us to talk about an ecosystem, obviously we have to see each other, we have to talk to each other, collaborate, uh, and not see each other as comp not competitors, but as collaborators. So we have done a lot of work in meeting with all of these organizations and creating trust uh, and building relationships, us with them and them with each other. Uh, so it's uh, easier for entrepreneurs and business owners to navigate the wealth of resources that are available uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, and in that sense, we have done different things. We have created a set of recurring meetups with business building organizations or entrepreneurial support organizations where we talk about their challenges, where we talk about the entrepreneurs' challenges, and we identify ways in which we can collaborate and address those gaps and those challenges together. Um, we have created tools, very practical tools for entrepreneurs. We created a map, which is called Tu Camino Empresarial, that organizes all of these support organizations uh, in a pathway, as it looks like a metro map in a way. 
Uh, and basically the entrepreneur has to identify what type of business they have. Is it a micro-enterprise? Is it an innovation-based business? Um, and what stage of development they are at. So they can navigate all the different resources that are available for them depending on their type of business and their stage of development. Uh, we're working a lot as well with the innovation ecosystem in Puerto Rico and particularly after Maria. I think we were obliged to be creative and to think outside of the box. And a lot of young entrepreneurs are moving in the, in the space of creating new technologies and, and new ways of doing things so we can have a more sustainable economy and a more sustainable community. So we're working a lot with innovation entrepreneurs to help them and connect them with funding. For example, SBIR, STTR programs that are, are very much underutilized in Puerto Rico and such. Let me see if I can have here a, a Dugamina President picture, but we also uh, created this event called the Borigua Entrepreneur Fest. Uh, we did it for the first time this year and it was a learning that we uh, came up with for the visit that we did to New Orleans to learn how they recovered from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the New Orleans uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem has also grown a lot and they have this event called the New Orleans Entrepreneur Week and it was created right after the hurricane to kind of focus the attention of helping businesses come back from the hurricane. And we were very much inspired by that and we figured that we should do something similar in Puerto Rico. Uh, and we did. It was an amazing event. We had, uh, we expected 800 uh, participants and, and a lot of speakers. We ended up with over 1,100 participants and a lot of people on the waiting list. So that's coming up again next year. Uh, and basically this is an incredible opportunity for us to all connect in the same space. What happens in Puerto Rico many times is that events, particularly networking events or big conferences, happen by industry. So people can mix, people can connect. And what we wanted to create with BeFest was a space where people from all walks of life, all types of businesses who come together could collide and innovations and collaborations could happen. So later on when we talk about our call to action to all of you, I'm going to come back to the BeFest. But pretty much that's what we do in Comena and I'm looking forward to our conversation. All right, so for those of you that kind of came in uh, after we started the conversation, there are index cards running around. So if you have questions on anything that's come up, anything that you want to get out of this conversation, uh, make sure you write those down, put them to the side, and hopefully um, Adeline will get, get those to me, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of have that as part of it. Um, that being said, we have the bulk of the time then, kind of just kind of jump in on some of the things that were not said. And, yeah. I guess I'll kick us off with uh, how, how many here heard something that's going down on the islands or for the first time in terms of programs? It's very good. I have to interrupt you. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I want to be at board places, but I cannot do it. Um, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Um, programs. Uh, how many of you have heard of these programs in the past? Yep. And how many are hearing it for the first time? Great. So, I guess in the context of some of these stories, right, we don't typically hear about them uh, when we are kind of opening our, our kind of thing to New York One or New York Times. Um, what's, what's missing to make sure that, you know, all this work has been going on since forever, right? We all know, you know, all the things on the ground. Um, that for that to kind of percolate the day-to-day -day of Puerto Ricans outside. Well, should I start? Okay, yeah. I'll start. Right. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, we are working very hard on visibility, and, and I think that the work that all that we're doing is, is helping um, to get our story out there in, in our diaspora and in other communities around the world. And for example, in, in Puerto Rico, after the hurricane, one of the things that we did, uh, we created this platform called Shop and Hire Puerto Rico, which still exists, and it's basically an online store directory uh, and, we, and we created that because we needed to find a way to reactivate our businesses' economies after the hurricane. Nobody was uh, buying anything. The stores weren't being able to open uh, because there were no lights or their stores got messed up by the hurricane. Um, so that kind of kick-started this whole thing about online shopping and supporting our local entrepreneurs uh, from the states. Uh, buying uh, to Puerto Rico businesses through online platforms. So I think that visibility is super important. Uh, and I think 
that we need to work a lot on inclusion and access locally, and that also helps us kind of elevate that voice of our entrepreneurs and the organizations that are doing uh, a lot of great work. Um, and I think that we just need to have more of these conversations so we, get, we create more awareness of what each other is doing and, and we can better support what's happening. When you mentioned inclusion and access on the ground, what kind of thing into that? <laughs> Tell us more. Sure. <laughs> So um, obviously, in, in at least in the Puerto Rican ecosystem, we have a lot of conversation of entrepreneurship around the metropolitan area, a lot of talk about uh, tech entrepreneurs, and it's it slowly, very slowly tri uh, trickling down to other industries and other sectors. And I, I think that still our rural communities are underrepresented. Uh, I think that um, even though we are all women here, we have a lot of women entrepreneurs, I think we need to do a better job of supporting our women entrepreneurs. and and all of what that means. Uh, I think that we had to do a better job at incorporating you know, spaces for disabled people to become a part of our program, to participate in our events, um, and, to, and to also be very mindful of, of our language. And we can you know, be very technical and very much in the weeds of the entrepreneurial work that we do every day. But people that have had businesses forever, restaurants and restaurants and, and chinchorros and, and all these types of businesses that are, are very important for us uh, feel excluded because of the language that we have, because of you know, the way that we conduct the conversation. So I think we all have to be very you know, culturally aware of you know, ourselves and, and make sure that we're opening the doors and we're including everyone that needs to be a part of this conversation. Now that you were mentioning earlier that half of your participants uh, were sort of women-led companies, yes. where, where are the gaps on those needs? Um, I'll go back for a minute to your earlier question. I think we need, um, one of the main gaps is, is meaningful connections. So um, the reason that I come to forum like these and others is to be able to connect our entrepreneurs with people like you. Because if we're able to establish meaningful connections, then if you have a good experience or a good business opportunity with one of our entrepreneurs, it is likely going to make you more interested in looking at others. And so many times, one of the biggest challenges that we have is getting visibility to these um, case studies, let's call them that. Um, um, and, and we work very, very hard to give them visibility locally. So in, in the in the local media outlets and on TV and all of these things, but our entrepreneurs are not going to grow enough if they don't grow outside of Puerto Rico. So the local visibility is not enough. And I, I will point you to a case study that is actually out in, in the local paper today. You can find it online. Um, there is a, a local company called Tiquetera which broke all of the records in selling the Daddy Yankee uh, concert tickets at El Choliseo. This is a company that when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico had four employees and could not have kept going if it were not for one of the um, emergency support grants that we gave them. So two years after Maria, they are now in the paper because they were able to sell the Dai Yankee concert tickets at El Choliseo in under an hour. This wow. is technology developed by Puerto Ricans. Um, and I, I, I get choked up just thinking about it because I remember the call from the founder saying, you know, the hurricane hit, the events are gone. Everybody canceled all of the events in Puerto Rico for like, I don't know, four or five months. I can't even remember how long it was. I'm going to have to shut down because I can't even meet payroll and I can't keep these people on here if I can't give them a check so that they can eat. Right. Um, so uh, I invite you to look for these success stories if you're interested in learning more. We have a bunch that we can share coincidentally. All of the entrepreneurs on Diane's slide earlier are Guayagan entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> and that that it's is not a it's not a coincidence. These are the people that are really making it happen. So tell us what we have to do to give these entrepreneurs uh, visibility uh, and please help us. Yeah, we'll have, you, have you written, I'm sorry, have you written up these stories and put them yeah. online? Or something? We have, we have written the stories and, and we've put them online and on media outlets. Um, we've just recently begun to develop um, case studies on our entrepreneurs, like academic case studies that we can share. 
uh, because we finally got into a point where um, some of these companies have enough traction and enough activity so that they can become a good teachable um, case study. Yeah. Um, and, but, but we really, really need connections to, to the outside world because Puerto Rico is very much an island in this regard. And one of the first things that we work on with our entrepreneurs is actually that mental chip of, you know, don't limit your growth potential just because you're on an island and you're only thinking about the clients that you have close by. That is also very true for um, entrepreneurs, as Christina was alluding to, that might not be in the San Juan metro area. Many times these entrepreneurs don't have the tools and the resources to think about their um, anything outside their immediate communities. So, um, and, and regarding the women, just to um, not, not ignore your, your question, um, I think that this is Something that is not unique to Puerto Rico, but when I first started at Guayacan, I, I used to say that um, entrepreneurs in Puerto Rico are entrepreneurs out of need, not necessarily out of conviction. Um, and I think that that still very much holds true because these are people hustling out there because they have to. It's not because they're, you know, three cool kids in a garage you know, building something because they're makers or hackers or, or whatever it is. We have some of those as well, um, and we encourage them to continue <laughs> to build things. But many, many times we have um, mid to late career professionals saying, you know, I, something happened in my life that, that complete, either I lost my job or I decided to change careers or, um, and many, many women that we see are, are some of these examples. People that are, um, you know, many times single mothers or the primary breadwinners of, of their um, family, and they say, you know, I gotta make something out of myself, so I gotta build something and do something many times completely different to whatever I've done before. So that is really why um, Guayagang keeps a broad scope, I guess, yep. in terms of the industries that we serve, because there are upper <laughs> I just want to observe a few things. Um, we're we're going to talk one fifteen, uh, but we're going to stay. And at the end, what we want to do is share a lot of the links uh, and resources to make sure that you have them. You can follow up and dig into them. That's sort of one. Uh, and then two, I definitely want to point you to the ISS work, which documents a lot of these stories. Which um, again, the Peer Science Trust uh, slash uh, Peer Cativo, um link, which we'll share at the end. Uh, but the end is what I just want to say. Yeah, no, I, mean, I just want to add to what Laura was saying about the visibility, right? Because, uh, well, a couple of things. They, obviously, we've come to a point in Puerto Rico where there's a lot of awareness of all of this, right? Uh, well, one way or another, some, uh, you've heard about entrepreneurship, you know what's happening. <coughs> but there is a still lack of understanding, and I like what you said about meaningful connections, because I think there's a still a lot of work to do. Uh, even though we're all kind of we're jumping the trend, uh, we still need to connect the dots. There's no work to be done to connect the dots internally, and therefore, you know, for that to kind of be amplified outside of the country and, and the island. So, uh, works like these are are really uh, you know efforts to connect the dots uh, and to to show okay, you know what that business that ticketed that thing is not just an isolated case. There's a couple of different things that are on that, and then that's the way that you can really identify trends, you can really identify gaps and opportunities. So, I, I think that you know it's, it's important, and this actually was inspired in a in a lot of work that the Inter American Development Bank has going on in similar realm, where they put out their knowledge, they connect the dots, and then the different you know key players in the in the region are able to then say, okay. There's something here, it may get the attention of an investor or it may get the attention of an institution that wasn't thinking about something. And this becomes tools for you know continue developing and continue evolving. So um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean and just tying that to also some of the questions that we're getting, um, who who supports through the advocacy for all this work, right? Like who who sort of leads that charge? What have you seen work? Who are the kinds of champions that have you know, connected the dots for you guys in the past that maybe might be in the room that might be able to connect the dots uh, that can be helpful uh, for them to know what's worked and what's missing. There's so much missing. <laughs> like what? Uh, like, you know, what? Your question reminds me. We had a magic wand. It's like, jump in. Um, I was asked 
about two weeks ago if there had been any significant uh, public policy changes in, in the last couple of years that had really helped the work that we do. The answer is that there hasn't been any significant public policy change or any significant lobbying to really um, improve the ease of doing business for entrepreneurs in Puerto Rico. But that is really what is remarkable because the resiliency of these people despite the horrible circumstances, not only after the hurricane, but it's just very, very, very hard to establish a business in Puerto Rico. The bureaucracy and, and all of the permits and all of that is extremely slow. Um, and there hasn't been any significant change um, in that regard. But um, I do think that they just keep going at it because it's just relentless and I'm going to do it despite whatever my circumstances are. And that makes me believe that they can be successful anywhere if they're able to be successful in this particular context. And to your point of you know, who have been the people to, to support us and to really um, carry us forward, um, this is also something we teach our entrepreneurs. I think that Guayagan's success is largely driven by good governance. So um, a private, committed board of directors that will support the organization through thick and thin, no matter what is happening on, on the outside. I mean, sometimes it, it's very, very challenging, but sometimes it feels as almost a bubble <laughs> because you have a very, very uh, strong group of people who support you, not only at a board level, but one of the things, I mean, I've only been at Guayagan for six out of the 23 years, and one of the things that was astonishing to me was the network of people, <coughs> many of whom you know, families who have supported the organization since the beginning. Um, and, and people like me and Claudine who are here and Francis are those people, but these people, they support our entrepreneurs no matter who is at the head of Guayagan or, or what programs we are doing. It goes beyond that. And, and these people have not only stayed on, but have brought other people. And right. so then it, it becomes about something that is, that is bigger than we are, and it's bigger than our programs, because it's just a group of people working towards a common goal. And that common goal are those success stories yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, part of, I guess, part of, part of what you know, I gather from, from what you're saying is that things happen in spite of, uh, not because of yes. whatever government involvement um, over since forever, which we've all experienced. We build companies, we build programs. That's how we still understand. Yes. Um, and it sounded like you had yeah, just, I have, just a quick comment. And then, uh, I, I just had a couple of points. Point. The first one is uh, Carlos asked me to get your, I think I saw circulating and the sign-up sheet so that we can yeah. we can yeah, keep yeah. you guys connected afterwards. Uh, right. so yeah. If you if you make copy of that, I'll make sure that you all get a an email saying you know where are the links and then you can plug in all the information. That's just sort of Perfect. an announcement. But the second point I want to make is that this is an excellent panel. I mean, um, I knew uh, your work obviously uh, prior and having a you invited us. <laughs> you know, but uh, but having Mirna here and Noel and other people that are actually looking at investments in Puerto Rico is fantastic. I just want to say, you know, I my my dissertation topic way back in 1995 was the crisis in Puerto Rico, and it, it seems that it's the same crisis that's been prolonged for too long. <laughs> Much less liquidity now than in 1995. But I have to say, <laughs> but I have to say that I appreciate the shift in paradigm to entrepreneurship. Like like you know, when I was studying this for the first time, and obviously. Pharmaceutical within managers, and there was a little bit of spin effect, you know, spillover effect on entrepreneurship, but not quite a lot. You know, the, the, that was the the logic of it was: we create engineers, we create managers, and we create that. So the parallel paradigm shift is, for me is very telling, and the ecosystem that I've seen emerge over the last two decades really is an explosion. And the legislation that the Anis was pointing out. And obviously, this panel and most of that and energy goes to uh, technology, to uh, you know, some connections to exports. Uh, obviously, the creative economy and so forth. I just want to call your attention and see how you react uh, to the new window that we have, which is reconstruction. And the problem with reconstruction, because the, the 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 private sector entrepreneurship is bound by the demand and bound by technolo technology innovations and bound by all the things that you dominate so well. And the ecosystem has been strengthened really over the last decade. You know, you can see 
uh, you know, from Paralelo to Colmena to this, it, you know, it's, it's shaping. There's a hope for where, where we need to go. There are, there are websites. And so that ecosystem for me is fantastic. And, and though we could have more entrepreneurs, at least you have mechanisms that will nurture, support, and whatever, despite Maria and all the other challenges. Now, what I'm trying to call your attention to, and pardon my, my you know, preaching here, is that the new paradigm is really economic reconstruction. And to tap in that Marshall Plan that we got, those $30 billion that are falling around, the type of entrepreneurship that we need needs to be linked to that social purpose, to yes. that reconstruction. And that transition from both our private sector, but more importantly from our nonprofits, is still to be defined. Now, I think that if, you know, if we were to put a coalition together, which I'm trying to be part of, I will say that the biggest challenge, I mean, there, all the groups are interested. The biggest challenge is that that connection from the civic sector, let's say, the nonprofit, to the people that actually know how to do business is so tenuous. <laughs> it's, so, it's so sort of weak that we need to think about that because I think the entrepreneurial skills that you teach and the, and the connection, the model, the sort of the investment funds, the pre-development costs, is exactly, exactly what you need for economic reconstruction. Yet, the recipient of that got to be a non-profit or a private sector that understands uh, syndication, tax credits, and a whole bunch of things that are not the language that we manage in Puerto Rico right now in this. So my challenge to you is how, I was going to use a bad word, but I can't, I can't. But how can we really make that overlapping of the ecosystem that we have for entrepreneurship, which I see it as a last 10 year explosion as opposed to, uh, to the social entrepreneurship side. I can count the people, the community organizations that can do syndication, that can understand how to get recovery funding, right? Mm -hmm. With one hand, they don't understand. And they can do none of them because they don't have the pre-development costs and everything else to do one single unit of houses, mm -hmm. the so way the RFPs are cut them Long explanation, yeah. to, long, long, long wrap yeah, to, no. to ask you, how can we bring those two spheres of collabor to collaborate more? So let's, let's, let's dig into that like a little bit, right? So basically, you know, part of what you're saying is you know, there's these conversations on, you know, $40 billion numbers thrown around, right? And on this side, we're having discussion of every major founder, startup, operating company program uh, is represented and we will either connect them with or know them. Um, how much of those dollars, how, how many invitations have you gotten to say, hey, you three, you know, we're thinking about how do we deploy 40 billion for reconstruction. Uh, how many calls have you guys gotten to say, you well, know, here's the meeting? Okay, so I've gotten calls, right. um, maybe three. Uh, but piece by piece, first of all, the money isn't flowing. So the, yeah. that's the first misconception. Right. So CDDDR yeah. money for it, it, it will. our space is right now non-existent. It, it, but it will. Um, and and I, I will give you a concrete example. One of the programs for the CDDG um, was a, a small business loan um, and line of credit for entrepreneurs and also for construction companies along the thinking that we had to support local construction companies with the financing so that they could in fact bid for the big reconstruction projects, housing and whatever. So um, so we get called earlier this year and uh, to talk about the small business loans program and, and so internally we start to have these discussions about, you know, do we as an organization want to be able to provide these loans because we see the entrepreneurs so we know that the capital need is there but if you ask us in our core, we don't. Really, that's not what we do. And and in my case, uh, I have a commercial banking background, so I was actually the only person on the team who could actually think about doing something like this. And in the end, we decided to respond to the RFP in part because I was getting calls of people saying, "If you don't do it, nobody will do it," or worse, "If you don't do it, they will steal the money." And so that's where. That's where I have to draw the line and say, okay, so I have to try to do it because I have to try to get the money to the people that actually need it and can do something right. of value with it. So long story short, they give us two weeks to respond to a very, very badly written RFP. 
Um, and you can look at Centro de Periodismo Investigativo's article and look for Horn. That is the company that wrote the RFP, and they have, um, I think, already invoiced about $30 million. Right. Um, and so we respond to the RFP in under two weeks, turn it in on tax day, April 15th, and go in person and have all the stamps and the signatures and the whatever bureaucratic process. And we were supposed to hear back by May 14th. We don't. So I start making the calls like, you know, this RFP, blah, 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 the deadline, blah, blah, blah. And they, you know, threw my call and my emails around like a hot potato. Nobody knows anything about what where the process is. And we get called on uh, May 30th, and we're asked to come to an interview the next day, May 31st. Um, and we go to an interview with three other people that have not read my 700 page proposal. Wow. So I'm like, you know, whatever, we talk about the pipeline, the entrepreneurs, yes, I can provide these loans, yes, we yeah. have the demand. What day is today? Right. We've not heard anything. It's actually, Laura, uh, it just, it's, we are not uh, getting to a few questions. You're actually talking to one of the questions, like, well, you know, now that the ASIC system exists, you know, how does it, how does it really go upheaval and austerity impact, right? So you have a story in specific, Life. and the end is the love you take on from a sustainability standpoint across, you know, your experience in the creative industries. Yeah, uh, so what, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were touching on that before uh, we started. Uh, uh, the, this sector, and the, one of the things that I focus on is the fact that it actually has a lot of money cuts. And uh, that's well documented worldwide. And I don't think that we've got to a sophisticated enough point in Puerto Rico where we're really taking advantage of all of this, right? So um, all the money logistical uh, uh, conversation to the side, uh, we have something and we have a great potential in our hands with these uh, things that are bubbling. Uh, and is that, you know, they may be small right now. They may look like, oh, this, this person started this little this startup about manufacturing in Puerto Rico, sustainable fashion. But the, all of these territories are, are the small initiatives that are going to rebuild the country if we really pay attention to them. So um, I, I just want to, you know, if I can leave you with something, is this idea that this trend of, of people of mind and in business, not only in the nonprofit sector, is really growing worldwide. Um, I'm also, I also have the chance to work here in New York with many businesses and I, a lot, I, I do a lot of work on social impact. And businesses with purpose and social impact is like what's really the thing right now, right? So um, more than ever, Puerto Rico um, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem has to really think about making a lot of new and young entrepreneurs are really thinking like that, uh, but it's not necessarily officialized, right? So how do we make this more official, more clear, more louder? and really get the resources that they need so this becomes something that we really pay attention to with like renewable energy, sustainable fashion, and all these little things that are bubbling that have a ton of potentials to make our country not only uh, come back to life but also thrive moving forward, right? So Yeah, I just want to definitely dig into this piece just because you know that that's been the ongoing challenges over time, right? Where all these all the ecosystem is connected, there's sort of all these conversations, all these things happen, but yet there's a gap, right? And it sort of feels like, oh, there's this friction and then things don't move, but you're like, well, you know, there's a the BFS, there's this, there's that. So I'd love to see your your perspective, right? Given the broad overview of programs, you know, all these sort of interconnections, all these different pieces, um, I guess from the top down, um, of all of us that might have different relationships, resources, connections, and ask, um, you know, what would be the right way to interface and partner uh, with uh, the ecosystem on the ground? Are they all these programs your thoughts on? So I think that Diani and Laura have um, mentioned a lot of ways in which you can interact and, and support our ecosystem, but I really want to emphasize these support organizations such as Grupo uh, Guayacan and all the work that the entrepreneurial support organizations are doing in Puerto Rico. We really try to not replicate things that already exist and are working and we strongly invite people that want to come from the outside to Puerto Rico to look at what's being done and not start something new without knowing uh, anything about what's happening in the community and who's doing what. Um, I think that um, 
and, and in response in a way to, to what everyone was saying, I think that I really hope that we figure out how to do that because I think that the feeling from the organizations that have in some way, shape or form interacted with this possibility of a lot of money uh, reaching us so we can help our entrepreneurs and, and our communities uh, is really frustrating, it's very ambiguous and nobody knows when and who and what. Um, so I think that just like you know, they were discussing in the panel, uh, in the plenary before, um, all of these things that have been happening in Puerto Rico lately have been happening kind of outside of, uh, you know, the norm, the, the, the status quo, right? So I think that it's not completely uh, a bad thing that we continue to work, that we continue to fundraise, that we continue to support our entrepreneurs outside of this infrastructure that is broken and that is confused and corrupt and all of that stuff that we all, all know. And, um, and if, if someone wants to support our entrepreneurial ecosystem, or even our entrepreneurs, uh, look into the entrepreneurial support organizations, look into what Yacan, what Dianis is doing, what we are doing at the Trust, and what so many other, I can give you more than 200 organizations that are doing uh, great work, uh, because we are on the ground, we know the people, we know the culture, we are very much in tune with what's happening uh, culturally and historically right now. Um, so I think that we always advocate and we always fundraise for entrepreneurs, but I think we have to fundraise for ourselves as well because uh, we also need to be able to support the teams that we have and, and you know, our organization so we can better serve our entrepreneurs who are the bottom line here. And you I mean, just, just a quick comment. Yeah. You reminded me of something, Gritina, which is in, in these conversations that I've had with, with some of the actors in the in the recovery funding space. Uh, you know, my rant sort of is give good money to the people that know what to do with the money. Yep. Right? So because we there's many organizations <coughs> and have the track record to do it. already doing things and okay. and to your point on track record and my head might explode, I heard <laughs> I heard feedback from funders like the EDA say to me, oh, but Guayacan existed before Maria? No, I'm not interested in funding that because that's not innovative. Wow. So, I mean, if a 23-year track record doesn't do it for you, then I don't know what does because, because there are many organizations on the ground that are actually doing the work and then you, you hear other people wanting to create new things, nuevos inventos, just to get a piece of the pie, and that's where I, I yep. lose it. So there's, to what you say is there's a lot of, um, that's, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to bring this program to Puerto Rico, they don't have whatever, uh -huh. right? I mean, how many times have you guys heard uh, this? And spend tons of money on it. Yeah, you know, if I can just get funded, <laughs> yeah. we can do this program in Puerto Rico, right? Yes. Um, so I guess to, to switch gears a little bit and make sure I kind of go through some of these questions and then leave some time to open it up to, you know, we'll see, we'll see what we're missing. If you have any questions, please. Send it out, you know, to Arely, and, and we'll, we'll try to get them through. Um, so it sounds like this is the the, the round thing, right? Yes, so in true entrepreneur fashion, you're suggesting that you know this is the coalition of we can get it done, we know who can get it done, mm -hmm. and we've been doing it since forever. So and it might not be us, but we can sure as hell pick up yeah. the phone. No, yeah. done. All right. So I'll do some quick fire round. Just some uh, ones that do do startup businesses need access to shared equipment, shared with maker spaces or tech lab. You can, uh, Anybody can jump in and keep it like 30 seconds? Do. Yes, they do. Yes, they do, and there's a, there's a good amount of uh, things out there already uh, happening, I think, especially in the tech sector. Uh, just to highlight one example, in case you're not familiar, uh, it comes to mind in Gen4, mm -hmm. um, who's created an amazing uh, workspace. They have actually got the attention of international players like IBM um, and others, and, and uh, just recently opened an uh, artificial intelligence kind of uh, Internet of Things, I'm sorry, uh, side of their uh, shared space. So I think a lot of uh, amazing things are going to come out of that. But definitely, there's room for much more. Quick, quick add to that. Um, what's funny about it before is that uh, they got so they, they were able to coordinate a million dollar grant, and they got Intel, Microsoft, and Samsung to sit together and collaborate. But you still have to figure out how the Puerto can sit together and collaborate, right? Yeah. Um, so another question to uh, I have an org in New York. I'd love to find some way to uh, so take programming to Puerto Rico and our partner. Um, might be this room. I guess discussions on quick quick comments on ways best ways to partner uh, and and what are the kinds of programs that might be helpful that maybe you're seeing out there that you know if you had a magic wand you could kind of integrate into the ecosystem. Okay, 
Um, so there are many, many ways to um, partner or, into, or participate in our extension <coughs> programs. Um, and for example, we have an upcoming demo day in November, 16th of November, where you can come and see some of the uh, companies that have been through our programs this year, both the, the early stage startups and the growth companies. Um, but I think that the, that the best way is to start having a conversation about some of the gaps that you were mentioning earlier, because it is a robust, grassrooty ecosystem. A lot has happened in the last five years, but there is still so much more to do. Um, obviously, the, our entrepreneurs need access to capital. That is, you know, very, very difficult because there's like a regional uh, or a proximity component to that. Investors usually like to be close to the startups in which they invest, and investors outside of Puerto Rico many times ask our startups, oh, so who has ho at home has backed you? Yeah, no, actually, just wanted to add to that, because we didn't get a chance to discuss much of the capital funding gap, which is obviously at the core of a lot of these things. Yes. Like, quick point where, I think around 2015 or so, the venture capital dollars in Puerto Rico was around zero. Um, we're now in the tens of millions, maybe sort of 50 plus, right? Uh, and a lot of those relationships are coming in, not because they know their deals, typically, because they always get this super question, it's like, I'm like, you have to go, and, and then they see the deals, right? And that's been my experience bringing other venture capital friends and others being like, hey, you need to be, you know, the companies, and there's more investment now, and I'm in Woodside, Queens, there's more investment now in Puerto Rico than in Woodside, again, okay? you know, tell me the uh, Woodside startups, right, or the uh, Puerto Rico led startups in, in South Bronx that I, I help out. Part of the New York City Innovation Collective, so there's a few programs in Puerto Rico. There's 300 programs here, uh, of which, uh, when you see where they're at, some of them could you could take a, a page of learning from uh, the lessons learned that they have. So, you know, that that is absolutely my ask: is figure out everything that you've heard, uh, how to follow up. Which obviously will get your emails and your sign up. Uh, Right? The sheet. Yeah, we'll get the sheet at the end. Um, and then one final question, I guess, just so that we have some minutes for maybe kind of open questions. We'll see where it goes. Um, what can the diaspora do to provide meaningful connections you're asking for? Is it invitations to particular events, conversations, uh, the room where it happens, kind of um, spaces or open spaces, by products, votes? Uh, where are your thoughts? Uh, I have We touched on legislation earlier, we touched on who advocates, who does, how does it happen, right? So it really happens with someone that takes the initiative of doing something, right? Starting. So uh, I think uh, I, I had the opportunity to you know, be a part of this legislation that ended up becoming a law for the industries in Puerto Rico. And I saw the entire process of how that happened, and it really started with three people talking. Uh, and three, three people that are not, you know, powerful or superior, have superpowers any different than any of us, right? So uh, I think it was just an idea and uh, it was discussed amongst the right people in the right moment and it kind of took a dive on, on, on its own. So I think it's important to know that we can start things and that we can put people together that need to be put together uh, and, yeah. So. Yes, don't, don't wait for permission. Yeah, no, I never. I, I would add definitely um, connections and 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 it's like what Danny said, initiative. I think that you know it, it's no it's no secret that we are very insular in Puerto Rico. We have kind of no other way to do it. We're an island, like Tom said, in the middle of the ocean, big ocean, or whatever it is. That we um, and water, but yeah, ocean water. <laughs> um, and it's hard for us to really identify and, 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 and understand this, the, the network that is available for us here. So if you have any questions or, or any ideas on how you could integrate yourself or make connections, just reach out to us. We have emails and Comena. We, I think we serve many times like a concierge service for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So um, we have uh, all of these people in our network and, and if you say, hey, we would like to see how we can support entrepreneurs and I'll send you to, to Laura and, and you guys can talk about how you can support her organization to support her entrepreneurs. So just reach out. So I'll add the asks. Uh, I have a quick question. Oh, that, oh we'll get to the questions. Um, just, uh, just wrap this sort of quick point around this. Um, uh, just to add uh, as, um, additional sort of specific asks. Um, just think about the spaces where you spend your time, right? 
forums professionally and others uh, and think about is this something that I should put on these people radar that I can make that introduction? That's sort of one. Two, there's all these conversations on impact investing globally, not, in the, not necessarily just in the context of Puerto Rico. Uh, and these are spaces where uh, they are not necessarily invited, right? Have them speak. There are other spaces that you might have heard about where they are talking about Puerto Rico and there are no Puerto Ricans in the room, but you might be in the room. Could you invite them and make sure that they're there uh, and they're asked? Uh, and so on and so forth around uh, philanthropic dollars are being allocated to nonprofits stateside, yet they have no relationships with uh, organizations on the ground. Right? So these are spaces also where. Also, locally. Yeah, we right? have nonprofits in Puerto Rico that literally do not know what to do with the money. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so just think about things that are in your immediate purview that you can make a call, make a connection, and just think, have, just keep them top of mind in spaces where you can meet them in. Um, and then one final question, and we might have like a minute, probably, yeah, so go for it. Um, pardon the interruption, I, I drove from Boston, I was double parked outside. <laughs> um, when you said nonprofit, my son established nonprofit over the last two years, he has two projects going on on there with zero dollars. And he's at a point where he had to postpone a nutritional program out in Chicago that, um, that he wants to roll out in, in the programs of PR. But there's no dollars for him. He, 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 there was a grant that was turned down for just ten ten thousand dollars. Is that something? Do you always also help nonprofits? Yes, that's a very very good question. Um, we have we had not historically set out to help nonprofits, um, but that has changed since since the hearing, in part to what because of what Ellen was saying about you know these new social ventures. Um, Coming up, so now we do um, help nonprofits with the same programs that we help entrepreneurs because, as as we were saying earlier, a lot of these tools are applicable for a nonprofit operation. And us as a nonprofit, you know, running our operation like a business, we see some of the value of using those tools for um, the the nonprofits on the ground. It's been very, very hard to garner economic support because entrepreneurial education or entrepreneurial development is not seen as a worthy cause. Um, but this is the first year in Guayagan's history where we have three local nonprofits supporting our business competition. So um, they are giving out seed capital prices to social ventures within the competition, and those are three longstanding. Um, Nonprofits, Fundación Banco Popular, Fundación Angel Ramos, and Tidin Foundation. Um, and we also actually have uh, within our, our growth accelerator program, we have a fellowship program that was started by an alumni in 2014, where, where, where that's the only program which we charge for. And um, this program provides a fellowship for the companies so that you know the tuition fee is not a disincentive for them to participate. And this is the year that we have the first nonprofit participate in the program. It's uh, Electorio de la Bahia or the San Juan Bay Estuary. Um, and we are using that as a pilot to determine if we're going to develop specific offerings for nonprofit because it is very much needed. Many of, of, of the nonprofits that did the hard work um, after Maria, some of them since before that, um, were not really ready to uh, really go beyond their basic capabilities. Um, and they're not ready to receive the funding or to position themselves in a way so that they can get access to the funding. And if we add to that the confusion that exists in terms of what the funders want to fund, then you have a, a perfect storm. Yes. Yeah, super quickly, I forgot to mention in the earlier question on how you guys could support us. Um, I think it, just like we to make an effort to come to events here in the States to, to meet and talk to all of you, come to Puerto Rico, it's not a hard sell, Puerto Rico is beautiful, you all yes. know this, um, and participate in our events, be a sponsor, be an ambassador of our, of our events and our initiatives, and, and I send an invitation, uh, for example, for next year's Bee Fest, which will be in March, um, come to the Bee Fest and meet entrepreneurs, meet organizations, and when you meet all of us and you see what we're cooking down there, I'm sure you're going to uh, become very creative and you're going to be very resourceful and you'll figure out ways in which you can support our ecosystem very quickly. Great. I want to be mindful of time. Uh, we're probably going to be here a few minutes from after, but just kind of want to like officially uh, close. 
Uh, I think primarily you can post these thoughts around, and you've heard there's a lot happening on the ground over the years. It's coalesced into very uh, highly integrated uh, web of networks on the ground, and programs, and outside. Uh, find find your niche, and they can help you navigate. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you all for coming in. And uh, at the end, we'll you know we'll, we'll call up. So thank you.